I keep a very strong focus on our existing businesses. If you can't have the conditions set for them to be able to grow and expand, you're not going to be successful in that attraction standpoint. That quality of life, those amenities that make sense uh, for both the companies and the citizens that live here, because ultimately that's who our client base is. It's our citizens, you know, trying to provide them a better quality of life. Well, if you ruin everything else, that's the reason here, that doesn't get you anywhere, does it? This is Brand Story, a podcast featuring in-depth conversations with leaders, marketers, and brand storytellers about their professional journey and the impact they're making on the world around them. Welcome to the Brand Story Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Gilman, and my guest today is Jay Langston. Jay is the Executive Director of the Shenandoah Valley Partnership, and the Shenandoah Valley Partnership is the Regional Economic Development Organization in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, where he is leading the efforts to expand and relocate businesses to our region. He has over 30 years of extensive experience in economic and business development, and in 2010 received the Virginia Economic Developers Association Cardinal Award, which is the highest award for economic development leadership. Hi, Jay. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks for doing this. I'm glad we got a chance to talk. Um, So what brought you to the field of economic development? How did you end up in this field? (laughs) That is a great question because when you talk to economic developers, you will find that we come from almost every walk of life because there isn't an economic development program in in colleges. Uh, There's some... uh, I actually was at the right place at the right time, uh, responded to an ad that allowed me to enter this field at a young tender age. I mean, I, when I had hair uh, back in the 80s, wow. uh, I was I was from the construction industry yeah. and I got a great opportunity through, really it was through my college's alumni uh, placement center, uh, got a notice of an opportunity and I went, hmm, this sounds interesting. I mean, working for the state of Georgia, in an office, not out in the weather, get to do some travel, talk with businesses, sounds interesting. Um, Got hired, early 80s, right place, right time, great bosses, great mentors, and I've never looked back. Yeah, obviously. You've been doing it for a while now too, right? Uh, A little while. Yeah, just a little while. (laughs) So why the Shenandoah Valley? What brought you What brought you from Georgia where you started to the Shenandoah Valley? Yeah, I've had lots of stops uh, along the way. I have been very fortunate to work at the state level in two different states, uh, different roles uh, in those positions. I've also been able to work at the local level and previously at a regional level. Uh, I've been in Virginia since 87, so most of my career, working career, has been in Virginia. And the various experiences of working at those three levels have really, for me, culminated here at coming to the Shenandoah Valley. I was working for our state economic development organization for 13 and a half years after running a previous regional organization. And when this job came open, I jumped at the opportunity to move to the Shenandoah Valley. And there's a little bit of history there. My wife is a JMU grad and we have uh, our oldest son attended JMU. We had thought about the valley as, you know, potential of of building a a small place here. We were mountain people, uh, you know, for vacation and it just didn't happen. You know, family and everything else gets in in the way. And at this point in my career, it was the perfect opportunity at the right time. I was acquainted with a number of the people up here, I the reputation of the Shenandoah Valley is fantastic. And I, it took me all of about 30 seconds when my predecessor let me know that she was stepping down for me to call her and go, you think they'll consider anybody on the outside? And so three and a half years ago, I made that move to the Valley and it has exceeded my expectations. 
Absolutely love the area, love the people. Just every every day is you know is is great. Yeah, it's a great place to live. I went to JMU as well long ago, and then started our company in Washington D.C. And we were up there for a good seven years, and then actually relocated our company to the Shenandoah Valley for you know lifestyle reasons. And then we're between a couple of major markets. It's a great place to live. You know much better quality of life than being on the beltway. So yeah, good for you. You ended up in a great place. Yeah, and you and you're speaking all of the things that we're telling companies about now about why they should consider it. You are a great example of that, Steve. So thanks for you may not have meant that for a a great segue for me to, you know, really talk about all of the opportunities, but that has become the most important criteria for people and where they want to live, you know, it's the quality of life, the ability to experience that. Fortunately, I think the younger generations are getting it right. They're thinking about that first and foremost, and then thinking about the job. And now the businesses understand that quality of life, you know, that talent retention and attraction, it's really important. And we are seeing additional interest. And it's part of the reason that I moved here. It was the same reason. Love the Richmond area, had lived there, still own a house. Uh, down there. That's where all the kids are, uh, adult kids, but that's where the kids are. But we made this move because of in in similar situation. It's the quality of life here and it has exceeded our expectation. That's great. Yeah. I mean, it's a wonderful place to live and I think it's a wonderful, wonderful place for business too, because relationships still matter and they matter in business across the board nationally or locally, but certainly the Valley has a very personal feel to it. Um, when you're doing business with people. So it's a it's a great place to work and do business. So I had read that your philosophy of economic development goes beyond kind of attracting just new companies. And that's not that usual in economic development organizations, is it? That is correct. <laughs> I uh, I was very clear. I, I let me give thanks to those who have tolerated me here <laughs> since I came to the Valley, but I was very forthright. Um, I was very fortunate in my role at the Virginia Economic Development Partnership when I was there. I was running the business uh, retention and expansion program and was hearing businesses talk about workforce is just becoming the most important issue. And I was at the right place again at the right time at the right station in life. I was hearing that regardless of business sector, regardless of geography in Virginia, uh, from all of the businesses. And when, when I was interviewed, I said, look, you know, if you're looking for traditional economic development, I can, you know, not waste your time. I am not going to follow that path. World's changing. And there is a time when I first got into the business where the quality of life was really important because companies were transferring people with them at that time. They were carrying their expertise with them. And so they had to locate in places they could actually get people to transfer. Well, in the 90s and early 2000s, that just disappeared. People were a dime a dozen. You hate to say it that way, but that was that was true. You you could advertise for a position and get 10 to 20 people per position that you advertise for. No longer is that the case. And I I may have predicted five things, maybe five things in my career correctly, but this one I nailed and it was workforce was going to become the dominant factor for businesses in how they do their business and where they do their businesses. And they have to consider all of those things. So yes, I, you know, moved to a place that I thought embodied just what you said, Steve, you know, the quality of life, the proximity of the markets, the, the cultural amenities, the ability to afford, you know, good housing, good schooling and those kinds of things. And so I firmly believe that we embody that and we have a great story to tell in that regard so we're trying to incorporate you know the the tourist attractions you know that we always sell to people to come here but those are assets that we get to joy enjoy every day as part of our messaging 
Uh, we are working on how do we sell the intangibles, and we know how hard that is, but we're doing that through stories, much like you're doing your podcast. That's exactly what we are doing with our Shenandoah Valley Living you know, website that we are having the people who embody that entrepreneurial spirit, why they moved here, why they stayed here, to talk about that, to convey that. And it's working. And we're hearing from the companies that they like where we're going with messaging for talent. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot like B2B marketing, you know, uh, in yesteryear's B2B marketing, people are like, well, you're talking to business people, talk business, you know, facts and figures. That's what matters. Well, business people are people too. So lifestyle, where their families are going to live, what schools they go to, what recreation, do they get to go home at night because the pay, pace of work is maybe a little bit better. All of those things, I think, are much more of a, a part of today's workplace than they used to be. Thank God. I mean, you know, it used to be a little bit, a little bit relentless in what companies would expect out of people, and it was a little bit of a, just a gerbil wheel of, you know, get employees, wear them out, get new employees. So I'm, I'm happy for that change. And you all have done like housing forums and career path development and all kinds of things that are a little out of the ordinary for an economic development entity, you know, in a region. Um, how's that going for you and how has that worked? It is going well. Um, and you've asked this at the perfect time, Steve. I think I, it's almost like I've teed you up for this and I have not, <laughs> but it is perfect timing. We're conducting a feasibility study, finishing it right now, and it's looking at our next five-year plan. And one of the issues that we addressed, and it follows from what my board has set as a priority, what we talked about at our retreat last year in the strategic plan that I had developed originally in, in 20, early 2019, updated last year during the pandemic. And it emphasizes those things that you just stated, all of those, those qualities. I just spoke with our consultant this morning and he said 99% of the people that he has talked to, and we're talking more than 60 companies at this point, have agreed that the talent, retention, and attraction, and the quality of life should be our number one priority there. Well, when you think about, okay, we're, you know, focusing on the talent, well, we're, we're doing it for uh, hopefully all of the right reasons, but people want good jobs, and if they're going to work, they need a place to to live as well. And isn't it all kind of a circular, you know, logic ring here, but it really is. And how the housing came to the forefront was actually from a site location consultant, a consultant that works with companies to help them narrow down their search, the, the right places to look. And we were questioned by this consultant near the end of the visit going, hey, I've just got one more question for you. Okay, you've convinced me that you have the people. You've convinced me that we have the infrastructure. Where are my workers going to live? And I was like, oh my gosh, I haven't heard that in so many years. There's something going on. And lo and behold, two years later, now what is you know, one of the things that's thrown out immediately about housing. And we have an issue like most places do at this point. It's not nearly as severe as some areas, but us being relatively rural, it's always been harder in the rural areas. You just don't have the inventory. You just don't have the turnover. We're fortunate that we're actually growing. We've got builders and the localities teaming up together to try to, you know, address this, but we're behind the eight ball. So when we had the forum, Steve, I never thought in my career that I would be the host of a housing forum. We had more than 160 register, more than 125 attend. <laughs> so it clearly resonated with people here. And 
it was part of what I would say is a discussion. We're not going to own this, but we want people to understand that it is now one of those socioeconomic issues like child care and transportation, education, that is now our lexicon, and we've got to be thinking about that. And as a growing region, we really need to be thinking about that. Because, you know, if companies are going to really locate here, they've got to have some place, some places for, you know, employees of different economic, you know, conditions to live and thrive and enjoy their life. And it's got to be affordable, it's got to be safe, and it's got to be convenient. So, you know, yeah, it's a big challenge, especially when you're looking at a rural area because you have a company put in a big facility and then there's no place to live anywhere near it. Exactly. And if they can't get the people, they don't have a place for them to live. Yeah. How are they going to get the people? Yeah, you, yeah, it goes back to what we were talking about. You're right. So you basically are, are an entity that's trying to energize all that so that it all comes together perfectly. That's a, that's a big job. That's not an easy job. It is. It's it's, as you can well appreciate, it's a challenge, but we're fortunate that we have so many people that are in the community that get the big picture. That's one of the things that I believe we're blessed with here in the Shenandoah Valley is that we're small enough that we know one another in many ways, or we're only separated by one degree or maybe two, you know, of knowing someone. And we also are the size that it doesn't take a lot to start really making a difference, you know, in making those changes. And so when you start talking about policy related to housing, well, because we're close enough and have the, the people that are in that arena who can work with the local governments, who, who know some potential, maybe national level developers, who understand the dynamics of what's important to the valley, you know, keeping our beauty, keeping the kind of, of assets and resources that we have here that we appreciate as citizens, you can start addressing some of these issues. Is it going to turn around in a day? No, not a month, not a year. But we can start that path. And I think that that's one of the opportunities. And that's where where I know I, I try to be a connector of these dialogues in people and make sure that we are not so much staying on task, because as you can see with my stream of consciousness, I can't hardly stay on task, but we keep that dialogue going and through that expertise, we start making some headway and it doesn't, it doesn't take much. Yeah. I mean, it takes connecting all the social, uh, you know, issues and challenges with the parties that can actually do something about it. Sometimes that's policy, sometimes it's private business. That's really cool. What have been some of the big wins for you and your team as far as attracting new companies? Because I know you've had a few. What are what are some wins that are particularly you're particularly proud of? We have had a very successful physical year from July one last year to this year. That very company, whose consultant asked me about housing, uh, is Kava. Uh, and it was not a name that I had heard of, but when I talked to people, I went, oh, yes, we recognize them. They've got restaurants in Northern Virginia. They have restaurants here. Well, they were the first to announce this year. That was the company who was asking the question about where their people are going to live. They have selected Mill Place in Augusta County. Uh, they will be building a processing, manufacturing, distribution center to serve their restaurants here. So that was the first. Uh, another project, uh, also food and beverage, which we're clearly very strong in in the Shenandoah Valley. Agricultural area makes sense. Yeah, is a, is a company, the brand name is Negroni, but the parent company is Veronese. It's an Italian charcuterie. Company. That was a word that I learned uh, in working with fine Italian meats. I just called it prosciutto or salami or so forth. But they are a premium Italian meats company, and they announced their first North American uh, foray 
uh, with a manufacturing plant that they are locating in Innovation Village in Rockingham County. Uh, and that's under construction as we speak. Uh, so for a large uh, plant there, then following on the heels of that, a lot of people have seen it. I think most people know what it is now. If they hadn't heard it, worst kept secret in my career, I think, uh, is the Amazon facility that is being built in Fishersville. And that one is not a fulfillment center. That is not the typical facility that people associate with Amazon. This one is going to be a large product distribution center. Uh, so sofas, refrigerators, washing machines, you know, big stuff uh, will be what is being built there. That's 1.2 million square feet. Perfectly located with uh, I-81 right there. And I-81. And then I've got to brag on the last one. And those were all three new companies that were coming into the region. And, and uh, we really had a successful year from an attraction standpoint. And our last announcement that we were just able to celebrate two weeks ago um, is not a name that many people would associate uh, with this, but it's so important to the region. But the Rockingham Cooperative is expanding. They have about 5,000 members of their cooperative for the farmers, and they are positioning themselves for the next 20 years. And it's really exciting. They have about a $17 million expansion of their feed mill. And, you know, while that's not sexy, you think about it, it's exactly what feeds us ultimately. And it's for the farmers, by the farmers. And they're just doing some amazing work. That's great. That is a lot of success in one year. It really, we have been, we have been blessed in the last several years. Our, um, we have been very fortunate to see a lot of investment uh, in, in the last three years. That's great. Uh, I'm really happy for you guys in our area. And uh, so that leads perfectly to my next question. Um, how do you, and I know you guys work on this very hard, but how do you balance the desire for growth in the area with what's best for the area, what, you know, I know you guys have very positive intentions about what you attract and how it all works in, in more of a holistic view. How do you do that? Because it seems like a very complicated puzzle. It's not always easy. That's the honest. <laughs> I bet it is. <laughs> and sometimes it's happenstance. I yeah. would love to say, oh, I've got it perfectly planned. You know, that never happens. But it it really is, Steve. The, we have targets and you will look at it's some region and some localities, not here in our footprint, but their list of targets is a page long. Ours is not. We know that we have been created by the farming, the ag industry through basically three and a half centuries here. And we stay true to our roots. Four of the top five ag producing localities are in the Shenandoah Valley Partnership. Rockingham, Augusta County, Shenandoah, and Page are one, two, four, and five uh, in the Commonwealth. So we can not upset that apple cart. We need to take, you know, heart in what they're doing and you know, work on that. That's the reason I'm so excited about the Rockingham Cooperative. It was the smallest investment of those four I mentioned, but it's probably the most important. Yeah, and it fits the valley. It's not like you're bringing companies that are, you know, heavy metal uh, or chemical companies, you know, because it doesn't really fit with the agricultural bent. Exactly. And that is, you look at our, you in basically, we focus on the companies that are compatible with what we have. We, you just said it, you know, we're not trying to be all things to all people. I don't think that that's a good fit. Um, I don't th think it's realistic. I think it would be a disservice to sort of the integrity of what makes the valley, the valley that we want to stay, work here and play and live in. And so uh, it, to your point, we know that we're not a good fit for some of these. For example, I don't think that we are going to see uh, and necessarily want one of the big battery 
you know, projects that's been talked about. Not because they are inherently bad, but you think about the size of these and the footprint and what that would do from a traffic standpoint, what it would do just from a, 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 a water quality standpoint when you're talking about, you know, a thousand acres and, you know, you're going to have, you know, a quarter of that under roof, there are issues there, you know, is that something that is suitable for us? You know, I'd really have to look at long and hard. And then you think about the impact from the housing, the education, you know, the transportation issues, you know, is that something that we would want to address? And I don't know that the answer is yes to that. So there are projects that we occasionally will get asked about and we go, you know, thanks for considering us, but don't really think that's a good fit. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. I mean, you know, growth at all costs, I don't think anyone is looking for. And, you know, when you know your strength is the environment and it's the nature and farming and these agricultural things that we're known for in this region, I think, you know, knowing that and embracing it, it's part stewardship, really. So what you all are doing is not just encouraging growth, you're more working on the right growth as best you can in the chaos that is growth. That is correct. And that's the reason that we spend uh, a lot of our time Steve, working with our existing businesses as well. You know, if you can't have the conditions set for them to be able to grow and expand, you're not going to be successful in that attraction standpoint. Because typically, the the ugly fact in economic development that a lot of economic developers don't want to talk about, but generally, a uh, seventy to eighty percent of your growth comes from your existing businesses. So. You know, we really need to cater to make sure that their environment is right based upon exactly what you just said. And the rest will take care of itself if you are paying attention to what you just said. You know, that quality of life, those amenities that make sense uh, for both the companies and the citizens that live here, because ultimately that's who our client base is. It's our citizens, you know, trying to provide them a better quality of life. Well, if you ruin everything else, that's a reason here. It doesn't get you anywhere, does it? Won't do a a whole lot of good in the long run. And I think that's really important to have the focus on businesses that are already here too. I know some economic development organizations just think new business entirely and they don't think about current businesses. So you're working with Rock Game Co-op and everything you're doing. I think that's a really wise way to look at it. So good for you all. Well, I, I will tell you, I and, and I unabashedly say, our localities own the existing businesses because the business, you know, that's the, they land in a locality here. We are able to provide the connecting tissue for our local, you know, economic development people and the companies because we do have a bigger footprint. We see beyond that. And if they need the resources at a different level, I often know who those are. And so we're oftentimes in the background with that, but I keep a very strong focus on our existing businesses because of their importance. They're they're the dominant you know, sectors that are already here, they're what are keeping us viable and continuing our growth traditionally long term. And you do need positive growth of, of new companies. But as I'll go back to what I just said, you're not going to have that if you don't take care of what you already have. Absolutely. That's a great point. And you all are affiliated with James Madison University, too. Um which is obviously a big employer here and a big part of our area. How important do you think that affiliation is? We are the only one in the state from an economic development, regional economic development organization that is affiliated with the university. Uh, It's truly a linkage to the university. Uh, I've got some peers that have close ties to the universities, and there's a benefit because of the resources that they can access that I cannot. I'm affiliated through the School of Professional and Continuing Education that Melissa Lubin is the dean of. Melissa is my vice chair, sits on my board as my exec committee, and I don't have to know everything that's going on in JMU. If I need to call somebody, I just go, 
hey, Melissa, <laughs> you know, and there is great benefit to that and how that really manifested itself in a concrete, tangible way was after I first got here, we received the call about Merck having a potential project. And guess what was one of the most important things? It was going to be workforce and workforce skill sets. Well, John Downey, the president, Dr. John Downey and Dr. Melissa Lubin, I should give credit where it's due there. Uh, they both, you know, been on my board, close ties to them. I had them sit down with the company and them tell us what was needed they started solving the workforce issues right there with the officials of the company and said, I think we can do this. Thus, out of that became a workforce model, the first one that I know of, at least in Virginia, of where Blue Ridge and JMU are working together to provide very specific skill sets that Merck needs in their production capacity and thus, we want a billion-dollar expansion over the research triangle in North Carolina and Philadelphia, near where the headquarters was, because of their ability to work together. That is a concrete example of how the resources that they could provide by working together helped us in that regard. Because I don't know what anywhere else has happened. Yeah, well, that's a that's a really notable and really great partnership with JMU. I mean, JMU is a great school. They've grown a ton. They are a very like get things done kind of university. Not as much of a sit back and be a think tank. So it's a perfect match, and uh, I think that's wonderful. That's that's great to hear because I think that you know. That, that's helping everyone. It's helping the, the people who get trained have jobs. It's helping the company grow. Um, yeah, that's a real advantage. Good for you all. And, and I love it for the fact that I just talked with the plant manager this morning, you know, and he says, you know, my goal is I'm probably going to hire 25 people every year. And I love being able to retain the people that we already have here in the Valley. And you know that's music to my ears. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm sure it is. So are there any like common misconceptions about economic development that you find yourself constantly trying to correct or, you know, educate people on? Yes. Uh, we are prescribed with having far more power <laughs> in influencing decisions than we really do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's probably the number one, Steve. It was like, well, why didn't you bring them here? So they just think they can call you and you'll make it happen. <laughs> yes, exactly. Or make it make it happen. And it's, it's funny that you, you asked that because for the first time when our annual report that we're putting together right now, uh, I've actually got the anatomy of a deal. Uh, we're taking the Amazon and, and tracking it from how the property even came up to my consciousness to how the decision was made. And you can see how little influence in many ways I had in that what I did is listened very carefully to what the developer originally wanted and then what the company wanted and it was, you know, right in what made sense for Amazon in the marketplace at that right time. So right place, right time. Part of it, you make your own on uh, luck there in that regard. But that's that's one of it. You know, I I was fortunate to have the knowledge of of the sites. But I can't make the decision for the company of, oh, you've got to go to this site or you've got to go to this site or you've got to use so-and-so. You know, I, I'm here to provide value to them to make sure I help solve their solution, you know, provide a solution to part of their, their problem. So uh, I, I think that's one of the greatest. And the other one is, is like, well, we need you know, a hundred jobs, go, go make that happen. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> You're not hiring a hundred. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I mean, you all truly are connectors and I think that's a, that's a, you know, a skill that you're going to have to have a lot of great listening and empathy for what the company and the municipality or the 
the everyone in the, that's involved, and there's a lot of stakeholders need. And then you know you're trying to solve problems and connect people and see if you can make things happen. So yeah, I think that people do think that economic development organizations are just going to push a button and you know all of a sudden there's going to be new jobs right there. It's a little more complex than that. Yeah, and 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 that it's all about incentives too. Yeah, that's right. Another thing it was like, well, you you did this and. Really, it's not. That's the that's the last item on our list in terms of things. If all of those other things are not any good, that last one isn't going to make it make it work. That makes a lot of sense. So you end up uh, working with a lot of different leaders from companies and and government and everything. And what's one key piece of advice that you wish more leaders or organizations would understand about economic development? I think it's part of what you just expressed. It's that we can be really good connectors to resources that they might not be aware of. Um, I will tell you, Steve, too, we cannot be successful if we do not have the private sector at the table because It requires businesses to understand in order for a region to prosper, and economies are regional, you know, and grow up from there, not local, that there has to be an attitude of of growth. There has to be an attitude of wanting to move forward. And I say that because there are communities that have told their leadership, I don't want anybody else, so they're going to compete with me. Well, that's a sure sign of a decline long term. And because there is no equilibrium of that, you get the perfect amount of growth versus decline. It's going to be one or the other. And that's been proven out through, through studies. And so I believe that it takes a good marriage of policy at the, the local level and understanding at the business civic leadership level to tell the story of, and I think that's what's done so well here in the Valley, of what we want, where we want to go, and then make, you know, implement, make the plan, uh, you know, of how to get there. I said that backwards, but you know what I mean. Well, I'm glad to hear you talk about storytelling because, a lot of companies and a lot of you know organizations that are even connector organizations forget how powerful stories really are, and you know that's what we do for a living. We help company t- companies tell their brand stories. We help them communicate, and you know when you have a great story like the Valley, you have so many different things you can story tell about. And so I'm really glad to see you all using those tools and getting out there and telling individual success stories and stories of, you know, the Valley, because it's a rich place to tell stories about. So I think that's a really powerful thing to do is the, you know, for your organization. Is uh, fun to do. Yeah, I bet it uh, is. For us. Because we have a, we have a great story. Um, I have been fortunate to have creative people around me. We're doing something, something else I never thought I would do, but we do a cooking show. (laughs) And that me, and it's in quotes, air quotes, you know, uh, but We have products here that we produce. You know, you think about Hershey, you think about Wade's Mill, you think about the other other things that are produced here, farmer focus and and the poultry. And we're reaching a national audience with this. I specifically target the site location consultants who work for these major corporations. And we're able to tell a story about our food and beverage through having some fun with an hour watching me make a fool out of myself mostly, which they are entertained by. But that has resonated with them and it is fun to do it. And I actually... I know that we've had a little bit of success with this because for one of the consultants, I I was asked to do a personal show for them and use Wade's Mill flour made, you know, cornbread. I call it the cornbread extravaganza, <laughs> but had fun with them. And it was a unique way to tell our story, tell a little bit of the history, tell about uh, why this was important 
forward it to us and talk about, you know, the ag side and those kinds of things. So it is about the storytelling. I, I finally learned that after 30 plus years in economic development, you know, I'm a little slow on the uptake. Yeah, but that's a great, I mean, that's a really human way to tell the story of a region and you're telling the, you're telling the story of the brand of the Shenandoah Valley. So why not be tangible and why not use something like food? that connects us all. So yeah, that's that's great, man. I'm, gl- I'm really glad to hear that. Our next one, I'm really excited about because it's going to involve beer and apples. There you go. Two of my favorite things. So. <laughs> and two things the Valley's very good at. So, yes. Yeah, that's great. That's really cool. So it might be the it might be the cooking show, but I have a question for you. What scared you, but you went ahead and did it anyway? Um, it was the shift to virtual oh, in really? the pandemic. Yeah. Yes. And, and Steve, it, it did scare me because I had never done it. And I had never, you know, I, I always have kidded. Well, I love to focus on me. But really, I had not <laughs> been in that situation where I was hosting events like that. And we decided to do something different. Um, we might not have jumped into doing podcast and doing social media type of work. And heaven forbid, I would have never been conducting a cooking show that we do live, by the way. So they, our consultants get to, when I screw up, they get to see it, but it's funny. And, you know, and uh, yeah, that was, that was a, that was a big step for us, but it had worked. And I am so less concerned about what we have done in the past uh, now about going and doing something different because it's worked. And I don't think that without the pandemic, we would have taken that leap, you know, but that, that terrified me at first because I really didn't, I, I didn't know how in the world we were ever going to do that. We're one of the few that jumped into this and now it's the best thing I'm convinced that we've ever done. Yeah, good for you. I mean, you know, when you're an organization that's used to doing everything face to face like a chamber or a, any kind of association, the jump into digital and the jump into, you know, producing content and, you know, interacting online even like we're doing right now can be really foreign. You know, but it's a real strength. So, you know, my podcast, this podcast came out of the pandemic because I wasn't great getting to have those great one-on-one conversations with experts in their field. And so I have all kinds of different people on the show. And for me, it's part passion and part, you know, spreading our, our, the word around how powerful storytelling is and how important it is to tell your story. And, you know, it's a, so I think there's always a silver lining, right? And maybe that's the silver lining of the pandemic has made a lot of us more comfortable doing this kind of thing. It really is, Steve. And and I did not, I don't think that I could have, uh, have articulated the message about storytelling like you just did there before all of this happened. Even though I have been in economic development forever, I never considered myself a marketer and I still don't. I, I so admire the people who have the creative, who can make that into the story. So kudos to you. But now I get it. I <laughs> yeah. really get it. Now that you're doing I it. I guess I'm living it. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, and I think back, well, all of the things that, you know, seem to resonate the most with me have a story related to them. And, yeah, you you really, uh, it certainly won me over. Yeah. So, you know, I've been, our, we've been in business for, this is our 27th year and we started in Washington, DC. And from day one, you know, I was a marketing background and, uh, you know, in advertising and, but my real love and one of my majors at JMU was theater and theater directing. And honestly, the, the knowledge that I use the most came from theater and telling stories and knowing where the heart of a story is and how to tell it, where it'll touch and reach other human beings. We all, are programmed, you know, biologically to respond to story. So I think it's wonderful what you're doing. I love that idea, that cooking show. That's just really fun, you know, and it's human. It's not stodgy. I think when, you know, when businesses are talking to other businesses, they forget that the people at the other businesses are human and, you know, that's how you reach people. So what's next for you? What projects do you got? Have you got coming up? What do you, what do you, where do you go from here? Oh my gosh. We are, um, 
we've got a lot going on. I, we, we, are, we are preparing uh, for the, the biggest thing for us, and it's an organizational thing, but ultimately it's, it's hopefully going to help where we want to go long term is we're going to do our first ever fundraising program uh, here uh, in hopefully the fall uh, we'll get the soft part started in this fall of this next physical year for us uh, because as one consultant was very kind in saying we really fight above our weight, which means we do a lot with a little, but it's getting harder to do that, particularly in these times. Uh, thanks to my predecessors in this position and the, the people that have worked here, they've positioned us really well. We've got a good track record. And so we are getting ready to enter this first ever event for us to carry out our five-year plan, ultimately. Uh, and that's new for us. Is it a little bit scary? Yeah, it is. But you don't grow, you know, unless you try to take that first step. And, you know, and sometimes that first step better be a little bit of a leap because you might just wind up in the bottom of the ditch if you don't, you know, jump. And that's where we're going. Well, good for you because if you don't grow the organization itself and your resources, it's pretty hard to help the whole region grow. You know, so you have to have the resources and the staff and the technology and everything in this day and age. So good for you all for doing that. I look forward to hearing about it. Um, so I just have a few more questions for you and I'll let you get back to your very busy day. I, I just want you to finish this sentence. If you hadn't been in economic development, what would you be doing? One of the first things that comes to mind would be I would be working with my hands. Um, yes, I, uh, I, I come from... Um, first generation college. My dad was a mechanic, would not let me play around with him on stuff because he didn't want me doing the same thing. But I love that instant gratification either when I throw the tool because it's not, <laughs> I'm not doing something right or I fix it. Uh, you know, um, I, and, and, and my parents would, would, would cringe if they heard me say that sort of thing. But I, I love that kind of work. Uh, I, I love what I do in economic development. I'm just not sure that I would have ever been as happy doing anything else but economic development. I mean, I didn't even know what it was when I fell into it, but I spent... Uh, essentially my entire career here uh, in that. You know, I love that question and your answer because, you know, I think building something and fixing something and helping something work, you're doing that. You're just not doing it with your hands every day. You know, you're just doing it with your entire being. So yeah, that's great, man. Yeah. I think you're, you're uniquely suited for your job and I'm glad it's going so well for you. So I have one last question for you. Um, if you could give your younger self any advice, what would it be? Oh my gosh. Shut up and listen. <laughs> I look back. Okay, I, 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 I tell everybody this. I told my kids, kids this. I said, I was, I've changed my story. I used to say I was the 10% that made the upper 90% possible in college. I was being kind to myself. I was probably the 3% that made the upper 97% possible. And... I had no clue of what I was doing. Um, I would, I would, I would say, go back and take a look at what you really wanted to do. If I was capable of knowing what I wanted to do at the time, stop talking and listen. Talk to people and then listen to what they said. And I think I probably could have avoided some heartache in that regard. <laughs> you know, I think that that's such a great answer because anyone listening can benefit from that no matter where they are in their career. Listening and just shutting your mouth is one of the best things you can do when you're trying to learn, you know? And it's amazing how few of us do it early on in our lives. Uh, oh, it is so true. I have been in economic developers of the guiltiest people on earth of doing this. And and while I'm a big talker, I think part of what has led to my success that I can really, 
I'm a hard listener too. I listen to the cues of when someone is saying, this is what I'm looking for. And I've heard economic developers launch off, oh, well, we've got this and this and this. And it was totally irrelevant to what the person just said was important to them. We don't, as I go back to the beginning, you know, we're, I don't own the land. I don't have the workforce skills. I don't do this. I connect, but if I match the requirements to what people are looking for and help solve that problem, oftentimes that's the value that they need to make that decision. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just being quiet and letting people, you know, tell you what they need and then Execute it. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, for your job, you could just call yourself chief listener because I think that I think that's probably such a huge part of what you do. And, you know, when you're trying to help other people, if you're not authentically listening, if you're just waiting to talk or you just have your thing you really want them to do, you know, you're going to recommend the wrong site. You're not going to hear what their real concern is because sometimes people will say what their concern is, but maybe you didn't hear what their real concern right underneath was. So good for you. I think that's a wonderful last note for us today. And man, I had such a good time talking to you. Thanks for being on the podcast today. Well, Steve, you can tell I'm a little shy and I don't have much to say, <laughs> yeah. but thank you for, I, I, I do enjoy it. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to maybe give a little bit of a glimpse in the world that people may not know about. And uh, it's, it's fun. And, you know, ultimately, the, the people that I think really enjoy this as we know that, you know, this is not going to be our, our way to wealth, but it sure is gratifying when you see a company open, you see a company expand and hire people and positions, people's position in life improve because they've gotten the jobs, you know, there. And then it can enjoy, you know, the quality of life amenities that we're talking about. That's, that's the gratification. Want to hear more inspiring stories? Subscribe on your preferred podcast app so you don't miss an episode. And if you like what we're doing, please rate, review, and share. It's the best way to support us. Thank you for listening to Brand Story.